Good morning, good morning, happy Easter. Uh, when I was growing up, one of my favorite things was going to church with my grandparents because when you walked in, there was a thing that they did on Easter Sunday. And someone said, he is risen. And everyone responded with, he is risen indeed. So I invite you to stand as you are able, prepare, as we prepare your hearts and minds, join us as we sing, and join me in enjoying and celebrating the fact that Christ is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. to see some faces I haven't seen in a while and some new faces as we are together to celebrate the epicenter of our faith that Jesus Christ defeated death and has indeed risen. We're going to celebrate and remember Christ through communion today uh, going to the scriptures and of course we're going to continue to sing 
And I want to encourage you, hopefully you've got one of these as you came in. Um, we are a praying church, and if there's a way we can be praying for you, the bottom of this conveniently tears off. Um, and there's a place in the back. If there's uh, a way we can be up holding you in prayer, we would love to know. We have a group of women who meet here on Wednesdays and are always asking, are there things we can be praying for? So um, please take advantage of that. If you fill this up, there's a little box right by the door where you came in. This is offerings. You can just drop it in there. Um, I always appreciate when I know how to pray for you. So let's pray now together, and then we're going to continue uh, worshiping. God, still our hearts this morning, and uh, give us the ability to be present uh, here and now in this place, and to recognize that you are present with us. God, as we continue to sing, would you remind us of the true hope that we have? Remind us of your love lavished on us in Christ. God, as we go to the scriptures, would you remind us of who we're called to be? And uh, Father, we just pray that whatever we have brought in with us as far as baggage or worries or concerns, uh, would you give us the capacity just to sort of set those aside this morning uh, and to listen to what your spirit might speak into our hearts uh, and to be encouraged. We ask all this in Christ's name. We're going to continue to sing, and we invite you to stand, sit, whatever posture helps you um, enter this time of worship and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Um, this space is for you to prepare your hearts and minds for what he has for you today. So we just invite you to join us as we sing.
this Resurrection Sunday, God, we ask that you would be with us as we remember your sacrifice this morning. Um, God, not just that we remember the sacrifice, but that we celebrate the resurrection and the greatest gift of all is just being reunited with you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. As we come to celebrate communion together on Easter, I'm reminded, for me, this is one of those moments like when you look on your back and you look up at the stars and you realize how small you are. We are in this stream that for the past 2,000 years, people have celebrated the same way. Uh, this morning around the world with different languages and different singing and different styles, people have celebrated the same way we are. So we're part of something much larger than, larger than North Park. And as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus today, we celebrate that in part because it wasn't just a cool stunt. It wasn't just defeating death or pulling a really incredible magic trick. It was a result of Jesus going to the cross for our sins, to purchase our forgiveness and our freedom. And that death was not the end. It was followed by the resurrection we celebrate today. Paul, when he writes to the church in Corinth, he says that as often as we uh, celebrate in this way with the cup and, and remembering Jesus' body and blood, that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And so we see this as an act of faith. So if this is your first time at North Park, you do not need to be a member here. Um, you are welcome to participate. We are going to pass uh, the elements, and then you'll hold those. We'll, we'll take them together. Um, and this is a proclamation. This is an act of faith. And so if that's something you want to join into, certainly we invite you to be a part of that. I'm going to pray for us and then invite the elders to come up as we uh, pass the elements. God, you do turn graves into gardens, and that is a beautiful reality. Father, we come this morning aware of our, our shortcomings, aware of uh, the darkest parts of us that we want no one to know about. And yet with those things, we come knowing and believing that you love us in spite of them. Those are the very things Christ took upon himself. And so as we remember Jesus through communion this morning, would you remind us that we are not called to strive to keep religious rules. We're not called to be good enough. We're invited to be forgiven and to walk in a new life. Would you help us understand that in a fresh way today, we ask in Christ's name.
that Jesus would be arrested, that at a meal with his disciples, he took bread and broke it and gave thanks, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would allow us to rest and to stand in your grace, your kindness, your generous love. Would you help us to be reminded today that we aren't partially forgiven, we're fully forgiven. Would you help us to have a greater understanding of the magnitude of your love for us and to be able to walk in greater freedom. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you for leading us in worship this morning. That was awesome. I want you to think for a moment Who are your most dependable, trustworthy worthy friends that if you were accused of something or needed a witness to prove you had done or not done something, some of us needed that more often than not, more often than others growing up. But if you needed somebody to have your back who was reliable, trustworthy, believable, all those things, who would that be? Who do you have in your life who would be that person that if you were accused of something, they could stand up for you and they would be a believable witness. I ask that question because one of the remarkable things about the resurrection story is who God chooses as his primary witnesses to what is arguably the most incredible and certainly most important event in human history. If I think about that, and the various ways God could have chosen to announce the unbelievable that Jesus was not dead but had been raised back to life. It's remarkable who God chooses. I want you to listen to the initial story. This is in Matthew 28, uh, if you'd like to turn there. This is the initial story of Jesus' resurrection on Easter Sunday. Matthew 28, verse 1, we read, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. You can imagine this. You've got to kind of use your imagination this morning. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. And his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. We're told here that some women had gone to the tomb where Jesus body was laid after he had died. And we know from Mark's gospel account that these women have gone with the specific purpose of applying a sort of salve, if you will, uh, with all kinds of spices on the body of Jesus as a part of the burial process. And it's these witnesses, or these women, who are the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And that may not seem notable to us. Women witness things all the time. But in Jesus' Time and in that culture, I apologize, ladies, but you were not considered to be reliable witnesses. Your testimony was not admissible to court because you were a woman. Women did not have the same access to education as men did, and they were entreated, or treated not only inferior in value, but also inferior in their judgment. Just to be clear, I don't hold to that view. I'm just explaining what the culture used to be. 
And yet it's in that culture that God chooses specifically to have women play the central role as his first eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses who are called to announce the unbelievable and unthinkable that Jesus Christ defeated death and has risen from the grave. Now we get one name in particular. One of these women is named, and she's Mary Magdalene. And John's account, in fact, she's the only one mentioned because I think he's trying to highlight it for us. Because it's remarkable that she would be a part of this story. If we turn to Luke chapter 8, if you want to look there with me, the first three verses of Luke chapter 8, we get a little picture of who this woman is, this Mary Magdalene. Luke chapter 8, verse 1, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others, and these women were helping to support them, this being Jesus and the disciples from their own means. So not only is Mary already kind of have one strike against her in the fact that she's a woman as far as being a reliable witness, but she was a demon-possessed woman. When you think about who you want to vouch for you, a demon-possessed person is probably fairly low on the list. She, this is who she'd been known as before Jesus came into her life. Today we might use a word like lunatic, crazy lady, something like that to describe her. The ending of Mark clarifies that it was Jesus who drove out these demons. And some scholars suggest that that number seven uh, very well could have been a specific number of demons, but it also could be just to, uh, that number it sort of means completeness in their culture, and it, it could be a way of just saying she was entirely overpowered by these demons in her life, and they had control of her completely. So to those who had known Mary Magdalene, she would have been uncomfortable. She had a very uncomfortable history and backstory and reputation. Every reason to call her testimony into question. But the Easter story begins with these women going to the tomb of Jesus to careful, carry out this difficult and uh, incredibly sorrowful task of caring for his dead body. No doubt as these women arrive early in the morning, they are full of grief and confusion. And if you have lost someone close to you, I don't have to tell you, that it takes a lot longer than three days to get over the shock and the trauma and the pain. And this wasn't just a loved one. This was Jesus whom they believed to be sent by God, who they had seen be tortured and murdered. There was a lot to process there. And the story begins with these women in focus, coming in their grief and their dismay, and their anguish to care for Jesus. And then you add to this emotion Sheer terror. Again, Matthew 28. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back what was a very massive stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men, if you can picture that. Of course, the angel says to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Uh, just note that this is such a terrifying scene that these strong Roman guards who are likely battle-hardened are described as shaking and then basically being frozen still, becoming so terrified that they're like dead people. Uh, quite typically, when, when angels appear in Scripture, the first words they say are, do not be afraid, most likely because they were terrified. That seems to be the case here. So these women are not only walking in their grief, they have the fright of an earthquake, the shock of this appearance. And then there's this unthinkable message. This message of hope that has, I'm sure, to leave their heads spinning. What does the angel say? Again, Matthew chapter 28, verse 5, Do not be afraid, for I know that you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here can imagine like kind of trying to follow up into that point and then all of a sudden you hear he is risen. Try to wrap your head around that. 
He has risen just as he said. So the angel says, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly to tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There, will, there you will see him. Now, if you can imagine processing all of this in real time, an earthquake, a tomb, big burly guards frozen in terror, an angel, the angel's telling you that Jesus, whose body you've come to care for, is no longer there, and not only is the body no longer there, that he's not dead anymore. You come in and you see the place where he was, you see there's an empty tomb, and now you're told quickly to go, that you're going to see Jesus again, and these women are commissioned as the first to go and share the gospel message, and they're commissioned to go share it to Jesus' male followers, who we find out don't believe them at all, and think that that formerly crazy lady is crazy still. In fact, notice this is the Luke. This is he describes how this goes down. Luke chapter 24. We read, they came back from the tomb. They told all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. They thought they were crazy. Again, if you can imagine in their culture how little credibility these women had in the eyes of these male disciples, Mary Magdalene in particular. And notice the emotions that are described as these women respond to the directions of the angel. Again, in, back in Matthew 28, he says, Go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. And then verse 8, we're told the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. I love the tension there, afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran, we're told, not walked, to go and tell his disciples. I would contend, as I consider this scene, that this description, afraid, yet filled with joy, um, fits most people in how they feel as we try to share the message of Jesus with our friends. There's joy in the message, but we're a little afraid, right? They're afraid yet filled with joy. And what's fascinating is it's in this fear and joy mixture that they're experiencing as they're doing their best to be obedient to what the angels told them to do, that Jesus comes and meets them. In verse 9, uh, we read, Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And what does Jesus say? He says, do not be afraid. Seems like a kind of impossible instruction, right? Do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee where they will see me. You know, as I think about this, there are so many reasons that we feel fear. There are probably, almost certainly some of us here this morning that are fearful about something. Uh, when I think about sharing my faith with people, I'm no different than you. Sometimes there's fear that I'll be rejected by others. Sometimes as followers of Christ, whether you're brand new to the faith or have walked for decades, we can fall into a place of, of, of fear that God will reject us for what we've done. Fear kind of creeps in as doubt oftentimes in our faith. There's all these reasons that we experience fear. And it's as this fear is present that Jesus is also present with these women. And again and again, we see see through scripture and many of us have experienced that it's often in those moments of fear and weakness that God is providing for us. Writing to the Ephesians, Paul argues something that I would contend is incredible and hard to wrap your mind around as those who follow Christ. The beginning of Ephesians opens as this. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. It doesn't stop there. He says, in him, him being Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. There's a lot going on in those nine verses. But Paul is arguing that, that God our Father has blessed you and me with every possible spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. 
He's arguing that God chose us, that God adopts us as his children, that he has freely given us grace, which is undeserved kindness, that he's rescued us from the bondage of sin, he's forgiven us, and he's lavished on us his love and grace, and also given us wisdom and understanding. There's a lot going on there. But Paul's arguing God has done all of this for us in Christ Jesus. I think for some of us, if we just pause and, and honest and consider ourselves, the thought of God being so generous and loving and kind towards us can be about as unbelievable as the idea of an angel showing up to tell us something. To really let that sink in, that that's truly how God views us and treats us in Christ Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to wrap our heads around thought that God would be that generous. A Peter, who's one of Jesus' closest disciples, one who uh, is a part of the Easter story, in fact, would write in his second letter that, that God's divine power has given you and me everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. God, by his power, has given you and has given me everything we need to live godly lives through our knowledge of Jesus. Everything we need. I just wonder, do you believe that this morning? Do you believe God has blessed you, as Paul says, with every spiritual blessing in Christ, that God loves you so much he would adopt you into his family, he would lavish his kindness upon you, and do you believe that God has given you everything you need to live godly life? I think for some of us that's hard really wrap our heads around it and to believe sometimes. Perhaps your response to that idea is similar to that of the women getting this news on Easter morning, that, that it's a mixture of fear and joy. Joy from the idea that God would do this, but maybe afraid that it isn't reality because, well, you know your backstory and your history and your shortcomings, just like I know mine. But Peter isn't finished here. He actually goes on and Again, again in verse 3, he says, His divine power has given everything we need for a godly life, for our knowledge of him, who's called us by his own glory and goodness. He goes on, he says, Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, hear these words, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. God has done the work he's done in our lives, has given us everything we need for life and godliness so that we can escape the corruption of sin and so that we can participate in the very things of God. Which still blows my mind every time I read that and try to, to consider it. That we can participate in the very things of God. Maybe that's as hard for you to believe about yourself as it is to believe someone would be risen from the dead. Whatever reason you think this morning that God can't love you or would still hold your past over your head, I just want you to hear what Paul argues. This is in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sins. It is by grace that we have been saved. In the last few weeks, I was describing grace as radical generosity. It's the most radical form. It's giving the best things to those who absolutely don't deserve it. He says, it's by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. In other words, your life and my life are pictures of just how good and gracious God is as he loves us in ways we don't deserve. Again, he says, verse 8, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's love for you, God's love for me, God's blessing of every spiritual blessing in Jesus on us, God's empowering 
overcome sin, to participate in the very things in, uh, of God is not in any way, shape, or form based on our past or our accomplishments or anything we'll do in the future or any goodness inside of us. Paul says it's out of God's love that he made us alive even while we were dead in sin. That he raised us and that now our lives show our proof, our evidence of the riches of his grace and kindness, his radical generosity, based on nothing we've done, but only on what Christ did. And God's plan all along, Paul writes, was for us to do good things with our lives that were prepared long ago. So if God has saved us apart from anything we've done, if God has blessed us simply because of his kindness, apart from any earning, if God has freed us from sin apart from our ability to possibly deserve his kindness, why then would God not also invite people like you and me, people with shortcomings, people with the past, people who make mistakes, people who are still afraid, to participate in his work, to be his witnesses? From the very beginning, God has been in the business of working through people who are afraid, yet filled with joy. His message has been shared with, with those kinds of people since the very beginning. Shared by people like Mary Magdalene, who people had every reason to question. And I want you to notice it isn't just these women who have fear and doubt. Um, after visiting these women, Jesus appears to his disciples. This is in Luke 24, and how are they described? This is a scene where a couple of the disciples have apparently encountered Jesus as they were walking to a place called Emmaus, and they've rushed back to tell the others. And in John 24, verse 36, we read, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among these disciples and said to them, peace be with you. What's the response? They were startled and frightened. Seems to be a theme here, right? In fact, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I am. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Which is interesting because he gave them more physical evidence so that they could be at peace that this really was Jesus in front of them. These are men who have now heard from these women who they discounted. They've heard from some of their fellow men. And Jesus shows up, and what do they think? They think he's a ghost. They don't believe it. They don't believe what they've been told. And what does Jesus ask? Why are you troubled? And why do doubts raise in your mind? In verse 41, we read, while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, they're in this place of doubt mixed with amazement and joy and probably some fear. And if you know the rest of the story, you know one of the disciples wasn't present. His name's Thomas. He's there when Jesus appears to the disciples and he has doubt amidst all of their eyewitness ter testimony, the witness of the women, the witness of his fellow disciples. And how does Jesus respond to Thomas's doubt? He doesn't come and slap him around and tell him, come on, figure it out. John chapter 20, we read a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Notice the doors are locked because they're still afraid. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. I love this picture that Jesus meets him in his doubt. He doesn't rebuke him comes and shows himself. Comes personally, inviting Thomas in his doubt to place his hands on the physical evidence, to see these scars, and to believe. As I think about the Easter story, the women were scared, the men were scared and doubting. Thomas was slow even with all of these eyewitnesses to believe. But it actually doesn't stop there. They didn't figure it out yet. There's a passage at the closing of Matthew's Gospel we call the Great Commission. It's in Matthew 28. 
Jesus is now again appearing to his disciples on a mountaintop. And notice in verse 16 what the scene looks like. We read, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus is in front of them physically. This is not the first time. And they're still doubting. They have the advantage of Jesus being physically before them more than once. They could see him with their own eyes. They could touch him. They could hear him. And they still had doubt. So I would just ask, why would we expect that we wouldn't wrestle with doubt? As part of our faith journey. We didn't have the advantage of this kind of firsthand experience that the disciples had who walked with Jesus uh, for years, and yet they still doubt. So why would we be surprised when our experience is this mixture of doubt and fear with joy? And again, what does Jesus say to these men who are still doubting? He comes to them and he says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And it commissions them, saying, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And then he says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus calls these doubting followers of his to be his witnesses. And he promises be with them. The very first commission witnesses were women, one again who was demon possessed. And then it was men who had every reason not to doubt, but they still did. And those are the players God chooses to establish the church, to send his message into the world. From the very beginning up until right now, God has been in the business of working through people who don't have it all together who wrestle with fear and doubt, maybe even when we shouldn't. And he's been in the business of using people like us, sometimes against our will, to be his witnesses to the world. Witnesses of his love and goodness. And I would go back to what Paul had said and just remind us that part of how we are witnesses is just in allowing God's love to be lavished on us. And as people see the freedom we walk in, sometimes we don't even have to open our mouth. They just see God's goodness. In fact, you were created to image God's goodness and love just in, in the way you live your life. God has been for 2,000 years using people who still have questions and hesitations and reservations and misgivings and skepticism and distrust and disbelief, just like you and me. He's called us to share this amazing, unbelievable news of new life available through the resurrected Jesus Christ. God calls people who have reason to be questioned because of their past. He calls people young and old, people with education, people with no education, people who are terrified to speak, people who are eloquent, and everything in between to share his message of love. And just as God calls us to participate in his kingdom work, with all of our shortcomings and challenges, even more God saves us in Jesus apart from any good reason we could possibly give. Apart from deserving or earning. And that and nothing less is what we celebrate this morning. That the resurrection of Jesus has brought God's love freely lavished on you and me through his generosity and kindness. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 5. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, but for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. And he contrasts that, saying, but God demonstrates his love for us. And this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, whether this is your first time to church, your first time hearing this message, or the hundredth time, I want to invite you this morning just to receive God's love for you. To 
receive God's forgiveness that Jesus provided for us by going to the cross. And you embrace God's call in your life. One thing that's true of everyone in this room is we're called to be witnesses of his love. With whatever fear and doubt is mixed with our joy. With whatever shortcomings we bring this morning. Like Mary Magdalene, we're called to receive this good news of God's love for us and then in our fear and joy to go and tell and witness that love to others. But it begins by just resting in the truth that God loves you and that in Christ God has forgiven you of your sin. And I want to invite you into that as I pray and then invite the worship team to come up. God, in a fresh way this morning, would you remind us that first and foremost, you love us. Would you remind us that we are not to be here terrified that we haven't done enough to earn your love, but we're invited to rest in this promise that you have loved us regardless of our deserving. God, where we're striving to, to try to somehow earn your favor, your goodness, would you allow us to just also stand in your grace, to just rest and receive your love for us this morning in Christ? Would you give us a faith to, prompt, to believe that you would forgive us? And God, with whatever fear and joy mixture we have going inside, would you, even as we go today, empower us to be your witnesses? May our lives be evidence of your goodness your love. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. We invite you to stand as you are able and join us as we sing.
Jesus.